um, get the panel started. Welcome everyone. This panel is Illegal Content Prevention, Detection, and Enforcement. Um, we'll be talking today um, and the panel will be sharing its expertise in countering illegal content around the globe with a special focus on child exploitation and terrorism and extremism. Um, we do have an international perspective uh, that can help us highlight the cooperation and collaboration that's needed to address these crises. Um, uh, the collaboration between governments, um, NGOs, the private sector, and we'll talk about certain policies, what's working well, where are their shortcomings and where are their opportunities. Um, so thank you all for joining us to have this conversation. Uh, I am Julie Cordua. I am the CEO of Thorn, a nonprofit that builds technology to end online child sexual abuse. And I am just your host today um, to help facilitate the conversation with this um, incredible panel that has been compiled. So I think we are going to start and ask each panelist to first take a few minutes to introduce themselves and the role that they play as a global stakeholder in this fight. Um, we'll start with Yoda, Ian, and then David, Steve, and Neil, and maybe David will go to the end if he's going to join us in a bit. So Yoda, if you'd like to introduce yourself um, first, that would be great. Great, Th thank you, Julie. My name is Yoda Suris. Oh, great, David, yes. Uh, welcome, we're just jumping in and we're gonna start introductions. And so Yoda is going to introduce herself, Ian, um, and then maybe over to you, David, after Ian, and then Steve and Neil. Great. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm Yota Suris. I'm Senior Vice President and General Counsel at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC, as we say, which is uh, much shorter um, a, as a reference point. And NICMIC is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have been around for over 36 years, and, and we've really had a very basic mission um, throughout those three decades, which is to help find missing children, reduce child sexual exploitation, and prevent child victimization. Um, um, so while we do a lot of work in the missing child arena um, and on those cases, I know today we are focusing on exploited issues. And I'll just take a minute um, to reference uh, our main program under our exploited work, which is our cyber tip line, which has really grown over the past two decades or so to be the uh, global hotline on online reports um, concerning child sexual exploitation, whether that is the distribution and sharing of child pornography images, sextortion, enticement, child sex trafficking, sex trafficking, really any sort of sexual violation that might be occurring to a child that involves an online component. And I know we'll be talking more about the, the cyber tip line as we go on today. Hi, so I'm Ian Drennan. I'm the executive director of We Protect Global Alliance, which is the largest uh, multi-sector um, international uh, network focused on um, ending online child sexual abuse. Um, so we currently have 98 um, governments as members, uh, 40, uh, 44 tech companies, and sorry, 41 tech companies and 41 uh, civil society organizations um, and international institutions. Um, we, uh, we exist to put um, online child sexual exploitation on the global agenda and mobilize um, an international campaign to end it. I'm looking forward to um, explaining a bit more uh, about that um, in this panel. Many thanks. Great. David, can you hear us? Uh -oh. All right, maybe we will come back to David. Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Steve Grocky. I'm the chief of the Child Exploitation Obscenity Section of the Department of Justice, um, based in Washington, D.C. It's part of the criminal division. Uh, our office is an office of federal uh, prosecutors, as well as computer uh, forensic specialists uh, and some victim specialists and, and others that work um, exclusively on the subject matter of, um, of child exploitation. And then because of our focus, both nationally and internationally, we have uh, probably 90, 95, 99% of our cases involve online uh, exploitation of children. I've been here about 16 years uh, in the chief position for about five. Uh, I look forward to talking with uh, all of you during this topic. And Neil, over to you. 
Thanks. Good afternoon or good evening from Vienna in Austria. I'm Neil Walsh. I'm the chief of the cybercrime, anti-money laundering and terrorist financing uh, department of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. My staff around the world help to build the capability of cops, prosecutors and judges to investigate online offences and a large amount of that is dealing with child sexual exploitation. We also help governments to form better policy, to criminalise uh, child abuse and to take broader international action on that and working very closely with many of those who are on the panel today. And prior to joining the UN five years ago, I was uh, sort of the, the UK equivalent of a federal agent for 15 years. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, well, thank, thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, we have a pretty broad topic today. The topic of illegal content online um, can be quite uh, wide reaching. Uh, so we're going to actually focus in to start on uh, and talk about uh, online child exploitation, which uh, I think is probably one um, type of content that is illegal in most places um, uh, around the world in some form or fashion. And so uh, we know that over the last two years or last two decades, the amount of child sexual abuse material on the Internet has skyrocketed. Um, and we also know that to address it, it takes a multi-stakeholder approach, um, not just in one country. This content doesn't recognize boundaries, um, geographic boundaries. This is truly a global problem that all elements of society need to address. And so I'm going to tap into a few of the panelists to try to help um, level set for us what we're talking about when we talk about um, this issue and where some of the opportunities are. So, um, Yoda, I think I'll start with you. Can you, because the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children really is right now the global clearinghouse for this content, I do find that it's the place that you we can understand the size and scope of this issue based on data, really. And can you maybe start us there and give us a sense of the size, the scope, and the trends? Um, and your role in working with the private sec sector on detection at scale and help ground us there. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. And, and I think to level set is, is really important just so we do all have a good idea of, like you said, how much this problem has grown. Um, you know, Nick Mick, uh, when we started the cyber tip line, we were receiving hundreds of thousands or maybe a few million um, reports in the early years. And then we started to see incredibly dramatic increases in our reports, really starting four five years ago. Um, so last year, just as, as a reference point, in 2019, we received 16.9 million reports. Um, and a report, um, you know, is, is, is reporting a, a singular instance of child sexual exploitation, but it might be reporting <clears throat> multiple images or videos uh, relating to that child. So those 16.9 million reports actually contained over 69 million images, videos, and other exploitive content relating to child sexual abuse. Um, what we've seen this year, so that, that was a huge number for us, but what we've seen this year and partially driven because of lifestyle changes around the world due to COVID um, it is even more staggering increases. Um, so we have done a snapshot for the first three quarters of 2020, so January 1 through September 30th. Um, we've already received over 18 million reports in those first three quarters, so uh, well surpassing the total from last year. And I actually checked this morning. Um, as of this morning, we are at over 20.6 million cyber tip line reports. Um, so, so the numbers simply are immense. Um, we're seeing, again, huge amounts of content being reported in those reports. So for the first three quarters, again, over 52 million images and videos and related content relating to child sexual exploitation. So, so this is what we're seeing. And, and I think to, to caveat that and also to Julie's point about the international nature of this problem, we are receiving reports from largely electronic service providers. So what we would all know is social media companies, um, companies that we are um, utilizing and, and online with every day, and also members of the public. We do have a public side on our reporting as well. Um, but those companies are, are international. 
users are international, everybody's on the internet, more and more people every year. So in large part, this is feeding um, the immense increase. So we are getting reports from all around the world, um, even though we are a US-based hotline. But um, you know, again, I think this, this plays into why we are seeing dramatic increases. I will highlight one particular increase. It's a trend we've seen over the past few years, and we definitely have seen it again this year, a very troubling trend during um, COVID times when children are uh, remote learning. They're online a lot, a lot more than um, they're used to, um, and, and a lot sooner in many instances than their parents would have imagined that they would be on the internet. Um, but this is relating to online enticement, which also can be known as grooming. Um, we had started over the past two or three years seeing an uptick and starting to really track online enticement, which basically is an adult um, typically who is reaching out to a child to lure them into sending um, images and videos of sexual activity, or in many instances, encouraging them to meet them for sexual activity. So, so again, just as a reference point between last year and this year, um, compared to the first three quarters of 2019 to the first three quarters of 2020, we saw um, a 98% increase in online online enticement reports. Um, so again, hu huge volume, very troubling. Um, also because we have seen, you know, indications that um, offenders are very aware that children are at home. Um, they have less uh, supervision and a lot of that is driving this increase in reaching out to children for sexually abusive purposes. Um, if I'll go on just a little bit and talk about, you know, some of the cooperations is so important. And I think this panel represents, um, you know, the, the nature of, of kind of the, the force multiplier that we need to combat this problem. Um, it is uh, certainly not domestic. Um, geographic boundaries, again, as Julie said, have no reference point to where an offender is or where a child is or where this harm is actually occurring. So uh, NICMIC partners uh, domestically and internationally with law enforcement, with families, with social services, with other NGOs and nonprofits, um, whether they are in our line of work uh, and, and trying to track trends and, and educate parents and others about these problems, whether like, like Julie's organization, they are creating tools and technology that are crucial to this battle, or, or whether they are on the service provider side and they are, they are picking up after a report is made to provide services and assistance to families and victims and what we all know is really a, a lifetime of recovery in many instances. Yeah, thank so, you. Yes. Do you have another point? I was point? gonna pause and see if you had any other follow-ups or happy to wait. Um, yeah, well, I might, I might um, move on and then we can tie it back together on this question. But um, Steve, so Yoda laid out um, huge volumes that we're looking at. Um, there is a ton of data behind that. Um, sometimes these cases are not just in the U.S. Um, can you give us a, a sense of um, what is critical to successful prosecutions in these cases? Um, Yoda talked about that the tech companies are responsible for, well, they're not responsible. They, as a law writes it, if you find it, you have to report it. We encourage them to look for it and find it so that we can have the information to prosecute. So talk to us about, in an ideal world, what is each player doing that can lead then to a successful prosecution? Where is it working and what are some of the challenges to prosecute in these cases? Okay. Um, well, first, uh, I think that uh, Yoda hit it on the head as far as uh, one, of the, one of the significant challenges that we face and knowing that some of our um, audience members are, are from law enforcement, they know this better than me, that the scope, the sheer scope of reports that come in through cyber tips and recognizing that cyber tips, even those numbers only reflect a, a portion of the actual offenses that are occurring uh, globally in, you know, when it comes to children online, uh, many areas that uh, are dominated by online offenders um, where they're collaborating with one another across geographical boundaries and country boundaries on the dark web, for example. That, that location, which has millions of offenders in it, it isn't necessarily reflected in the 20 million numbers that, that Yoda is identifying. And so first and foremost, one of the big challenges for prosecuting is, is just that sheer size and scope of, of identifying and triaging what 
we actually can focus on with the, the resources that we have. Uh, resource limitation, as in every enforcement area, is very prominent here uh, when it comes to online child exploitation. Um, and so that that's a massive challenge of trying to triage and identify what are the most you know, significant offenders, the ones that, that perhaps are working in groups or are, are contact defending against children, producing imagery. That's first and foremost. Second is identification of them. Uh, this is a crime type where we can frequently see the crime occurring, sometimes in real time, through live transmission or through um, literally the evolution of a, you can see a child grow up uh, through illicit imagery of them being produced. Uh, but you can identify the offender that is producing them, uh, that, that content, and you can identify the victim and actually safeguard them and rescue them from that ongoing abuse. Uh, and so identification is another key feature here that can really limit our ability to both investigate and prosecute uh, individuals that are committing these crimes. Uh, many technologies now exist uh, in a way that inhibits the ability to, to know exactly what's happening um, on their platforms, as well as using uh, things like anonymization technologies or other proxying technologies. So you, can't, you can see the offenses, but you don't know, even know where they are. And that ties into another problem, which is that historically investigators and prosecutors have, have worked based on their, their local jurisdiction. So they've been able to restrict their, what they focus on based on what's happening in their own backyard. And we see time and again in the online space, not only can we not do that domestically in the United States, so an investigator here in, in Washington, D.C. can't just focus on offenders in Washington, D.C. That's impossible. If they go online and look for offenders, they're going to find offenders all over the country and they're going to find offenders all over the world. And so that network of collaboration amongst investigators and prosecutors has to be well developed and has to be uh, nurtured in a, a very meaningful way because we need to react so rapidly when we do encounter those children that need safeguarding and we do encounter those offenders that are, uh, are, are abusing children in real time. Uh, the last area and perhaps the one that I think your question probably focuses on most is, is evidence gathering is a really difficult feature when it comes to this offense type. Um, while there are some internet-based companies that do a very, very good job of um, reporting offenses when they encounter them, retaining that evidence um, so that when lawful process is provided to them, that that can be supplied to law enforcement, um, many do not. And that's just the reality. Um, and there's not a requirement under U.S. law, really most law in the, in the world, that requires them to do that. Sometimes law works in the other way, where it requires actually uh, destruction of, of what would be evidence if a crime has occurred. Um, and so we see time and again where if we get over the first few hurdles that I mentioned, where we've zeroed in on a significant offender, pool of offenders, we've identified at least crimes occurring and perhaps screen names of individuals, and even sometimes those individuals themselves that are committing those offenses, gathering the evidence uh, from the providers can be quite challenging. Uh, and that's just when it's domestic. You know, very often and more often uh, each day, it's technologies that are outside of our jurisdictions. Meals in Geneva, and and so I have cases all the time that sometimes involve evidence. The offenders in the United States, the victims in the United States, but the evidence relating to that abuse is in Switzerland or in uh, Austria uh, or some other part of Europe. And so that requires uh, sometimes complex international legal instruments to gather that evidence. That can take months, it can take years sometimes uh, to exchange lawfully the information between countries. Uh, and that creates delay, of course. It creates um, you know very difficult situations when you look at the international plane of, of how to deal with those complex issues. So I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to go too long. Sometimes I, I do that. Um, if you have follow up, I'm, I'm happy to answer. But um, you know, I think that the key here is that you know we're we're just getting to a place now. We're sort of you know, if you create it to a lifetime, we're we're crawling when it comes to the type of international collaboration and the type of of work with internet providers for this crime type that is really necessary to make a dent against the offenders, uh, which really have the upper hand. It, it just is the way that the online communities have grown and the way the international community and our laws sort of 
very slow to keep pace with that ever-changing internet um, internet world. Thank you, and I and I'm I, I have a question for Ian, and then I want to come back to a few big challenges that are on her horizon for detection and probably prosecution and investigation. So, Ian. Um, we've talked about how important global collaboration is and something unique about this issue is that this is a really hard issue to talk about because it's quite painful. And so you don't see the issue of child sexual abuse online um, on global agendas, on national agendas, being talked about by the leaders of countries, which personally I think it should be. And um, you outlined when you introduced yourself that We Protect's mission is to get this on the global agenda. Can you talk to us about the progress being made to put it onto global agendas and bring more countries um, and stakeholders around the world to this issue? Absolutely. So. I think our, our two foundational principles as, as an alliance are one, that this is a global crime that needs a global solution. And secondly, that no single entity, no matter how powerful or wealthy it might be, can tackle it on its own. We all have a different piece of the puzzle, as Steve was just alluding to, in terms of um, getting evidence from other, from other jurisdictions. So our, our role is to try and build and deliver that collaboration. And I think we have come a long way since this problem first um, emerged um, a, a, as a serious issue in the early 2000s. I think there was a tendency previously to see this as a Western problem. This is something for countries with uh, you know, very advanced infrastructures. It's about the US, it's about um, Australia, it's about Europe. That's not the case anymore. Actually, the biggest risks are for those countries that are where um, they've got big youth populations, where digital access is going like this. Um, and um, that's happening in a way that's leapfrogging technology. So I used to work in Afghanistan and the police were getting their pay online via, via mobile transactions. You were going straight. You weren't go using landlines. You're going. You weren't using faxes. You weren't using broadband. It's going straight to the internet in your pocket. And none of the safeguards that we've uh, that, that have kind of built up organically, if you're moving through that progression, say in in the UK, that's not there for for countries, for example, in Africa or um, or Asia. So we've been doing a big effort in bringing more of those countries on board. So we did a big project. Um, last year with the African Union, who now sit on our board, culminating um, in, in a summit that we held at their headquarters um, in Addis Ababa last year. Um, and uh, we've, um, we've been able to understand more about um, the threat in Africa. And we, we've already seen some of the, some of the actions um, coming through on that. So Ghana have just last week passed a cybersecurity law um, which which was banning child sexual abuse material, um, taking action against um, online enticement or grooming, um, and, and enforcing um, reporting and takedown. Um, so that's the kind of progress we're seeing. We're also seeing, uh, so since April, we've had a 40% growth in our um, private sector membership, which is a really, really important constituency for us, because in large part, they can control the space. Um, they can... Uh, uh, um, not not just in terms of tech firms, in terms of um, social media platforms or communications channels, but also in terms of financial services. So we've had some really interesting conversations with the likes of Scotiabank on what they can do to disrupt the financial transactions that you're seeing through um, live streamed abuse, which is a particularly um, horrendous phenomenon where uh, offenders sitting in one country are able to direct abuse of a, of a child victim um, in another, and it's coming at the problem in a number of in a number of different ways. Um, but we have um, we have seen some good progress. There's always more to do, and I think the challenge is this is an issue um, where the actual material is like kryptonite. It's radioactive. You can't if you look at it, it will do you harm. And there are huge welfare programs for those who are you know uh, doing the fantastic work of monitoring it. To make sure that doesn't happen. So how do you show that trauma without showing it in a way? And we feel the most powerful way is by empowering the survivors of abuse um, to tell their story, to, to um, allow them to um, set out what they see as the, 
as what needs to happen um, and 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 for them to get heavily involved in in advocacy because all of those that I've met have been incredibly articulate and have very strong views um, and that's something that we want to do more of in in our work. Thank you and I um, I want to touch on or, or bring to light two pretty significant external threats to this work um, and then jump into um, how this connects also to terrorism and extremism but I would be re remiss if I didn't bring to light Ian, if you could shed some light on in the EU right now there is um, a interim legislation or interim regulation that needs to be approved in December or else companies it will be illegal for companies to detect this material um, and that is after so much progress that has been made over the last decade of getting companies to detect egregious documentation of the abuse of children, that we would not be able to do that moving forward um, would be a significant hit to this effort and we would leave many children behind. Can I, I wanna just shed light on that because if, if we don't, I think we're ignoring a significant um, threat to the, to the welfare of the children we serve. So can you shed some light on where that is right now no, no, you're you're absolutely right. Um, you know, as things stand, um, if uh, different um, the European Parliament um, doesn't agree on, on on a way forward, along with the European Commission and the Council of Ministers, um, the these tools after twentieth of December um, will not be able to be used. And and as you said, Julie, these are really fundamental tools. They're long standing. Um, uh, parts of the armory for for um, for law enforcement. Um, these are things that have been operating. Uh, you know, photo DNA has been going since two thousand and nine, um, and the risk is that this could fall off a cliff edge on the on the twentieth of, of December. So we've been pushing really hard alongside um, Thorn and, and and others to to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and the risk on this goes well beyond the the EU. Um, the, the Europol um, executive, executive director said today that Europe is now the center of host epicenter of hosting child sexual abuse images. So you could have offenders um, uh, offenders in the US that are accessing images on it, it based uh, in in Europe. We can't. We've seen displacement of of offending to more permissive environments. We can't have Europe being that um, permissive environment. And I think the fundamental issue here is around the extent to which privacy is an absolute right. Our view, um, as strongly backed by, by Thorne and other child protection experts, is that the privacy of vulnerable child victims of online child sexual abuse and exploitation is not being prioritized in the debate. Um, we don't argue that there is a long, there is a requirement for a long-term solution, but there can't be a cliff edge. The existing provisions need to be protected to give us time to arrive at a long-term solution. Um, there's a change.org um, petition um, that's that's out there, which I would encourage um, everyone to to sign on this. But I think the the, the real risk is is that this happens in the shadows, and one of some of the really powerful preventative tools that we now have access to aren't able to be used. Um, so this isn't some dry EU bureaucrat issue. This is this is real world protection of, of children. Yoda, did you want to jump in? I, I just wanted to, to jump in also. Um, and, and I think that was a great um, background for, for the audience on the issue. Um, Nick Mick has also been working very closely with We Protect and with Thorne on this issue. And last night we did put up a, a blog that hopefully is as accessible as it can get around, around these procedures and the issues and what's at stake. So it is located on the homepage of our website, missingkids.org. And there also are links through to the change.org petition. We've had some great pickup this morning on that and some really powerful comments as well um, from individuals who've been signing it. So I would encourage everyone to, to go there and also to, to reach out to We Protect Thorn and Nick Mick um, if you have more uh, questions or want more information about the potential impact. All right, last topic on this before we move over to, to talk about a bit about terrorism. So um, one of the other potential threats to this, I think Ian, you mentioned, um, we talk a lot about privacy. Privacy is incredibly important. 
Um, but we also think about the privacy of the children who could never have consented to the documentation of their abuse and for that abuse to live on online for the rest of their lives. They did not have an opportunity to opt in for privacy. And so we are in a situation where many of the major messaging platforms are moving to end to end encryption. Um, we have Facebook who in this fight has been a good player. They, they have, uh, have been incredibly active in detection of child sexual abuse material. I think um, in 2019, 15 million reports came from Facebook. Um, they have committed to now encrypting Messenger and there are other um, platforms that are in that world as well. Um, when they do what we've just talked about, um, getting visibility to the transmission of millions of pieces of documentation of violent sexual abuse of children, as well as grooming, which we just heard is on the rise, um, will disappear. And it won't, well, it won't actually disappear. It will be there, but um, there will be no proactive measure to detect it. Um, I, Steve, Yoda, Ian, any, any color you want to add to that, I think it's important to shed light on that issue and make sure we are very clear about the fact that we are not weighing the privacy of these children in some of those decisions right now. I'll just jump in, and I think um, you know both you and Ian have have mentioned it, but but we we have this sort of cataclysmic conflict that that's been brewing now between privacy and child safety, as if there is no um, as if there are no options which could accommodate both of these very important rights. Um, and certainly, Nick Mick's position, I think many of those um, on the phone as well would share this, is that you know we we cannot simply you know have um, uh, child safety issues or uh, the survivors um, of this uh, hor horrific crime online be collateral damage to some sort of absolute, um, you know, dedication to to privacy. I think that the concepts are really not fully understood by the general public. I, I think there's a lot of misinformation regarding um, scanning or using photo DNA, um, but but the the encryption kind of drumbeat um, is, is one that we're all going to really have to face, I think, in, in the coming year or so. Anyone else want to chime in on that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just add that, you know, the, it, it's a very interesting, I think, comparison when you look at the physical world versus the digital one and what the, I think, what society's expectations are from a cultural standpoint when it comes to the protection of children. And in the physical world, I think throughout most of the world, there's just this expectation that those interests of children are going to be paramount of a society and, and put very much out in front. Um, whereas in the digital world, at least uh, in this dialogue thus far, culturally that hasn't been happening. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think this this panel and other efforts and the, the Nick Nick effort you know, definitely tries to shine a light on that disparity to some extent. But I mean, that's really where we are uh, as a global culture and global society. And, you know, understanding that a balance has to be struck that doesn't sacrifice one and, you know, in the effort to, to, to propagate another is really the key. Uh, but, you know, and we can talk, I'm a prosecutor, and we can talk about it as far as like the impact on cases and the impact on uh, reporting to NCMEC or what we know um, in any context, but at the end of the day, it's it's a societal problem and a cultural problem where we're all right now at least willing to accept that we're just not going to know. We're going to be okay with with individuals, you know, committing these types of offenses uh, against children that are welcomed on these exact same environments. You know, so we often uh, we analogize it to you know inviting the children in the room with the adults, turning the lights out, and leaving. And you know, is that something we would accept in the physical world? And I think the answer is universally no. We wouldn't allow that, but somehow in the digital world right now, it's acceptable. Yeah, I want to move us on. Uh, no. Sorry, Ian, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us moving because right. I I realize we have a few other panelists we want to bring into the conversation. So um, we talked a lot about the increase in grooming when it comes to child exploitation, but kind of grooming and. Um, bringing people into communities around like-minded ideologies has been something that has been at the heart of terrorism and extremism online for, for quite a while. Um, 
David, I wonder if you can share with us a bit about the tactics you're seeing extremist groups use to groom new members and share propaganda and what is going well right now in the fight um, as it relates to cross-sector collaboration and, and where would you say there's opportunities for improvement in, in that? Sure. Thanks, Julie. And, and uh, I apologize for not being there for the introductions. I think uh, Stephen covered uh, quite a bit about what government does to detect and uh, prosecute uh, crimes in the online space. Uh, our office, the Office for Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention, aims to prevent acts of targeted violence and terrorism by collaborating with local communities to build a whole of society prevention architecture. Uh, many of our prevention efforts are aimed at a societal level change, but the office's core goal is to equip and empower local officials, including peers, teachers, community leaders, parents, uh, and also law enforcement to prevent individuals from mobilizing to violence before it becomes a law enforcement matter. Uh, unfortunately, the digital space uh, has certainly evolved to open the doors for radicalization and recruitment by harmful actors, and it's important to focus on the many ways that technology can be used for good, including uh, amplifying credible uh, local voices online, uh, countering harmful and malicious narratives, and providing an opportunity for interventions. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing, though, it's specific to your question, uh, extremists are certainly taking advantage of the immense kids are spending online. Uh, I have uh, five children myself, and at one point, all five of them were teenagers. Uh, they're almost all adults now, and I see the amount of, of time that's spent. Uh, unfortunately, it, it can it occupy almost the majority of a day, uh, and extremists are taking advantage of this. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, Zoom bombing, for instance, where malicious actors infiltrate the classroom and meetings and other presentations to project extremist images and narratives, uh, video teleconferencing platforms, have mostly been successful in, in taking measures uh, to protect these calls, but reporting this uh, is really the responsibility of those who see it. Government and the industry itself can't be everywhere. Uh, if, you, if you think about the amount of, of time spent online, uh, we can't expect uh, the government agencies and the industry itself uh, is monitoring everything. Uh, so it really does become a, uh, uh, a whole of society approach. Uh, social isolation is certainly something that, that's also becoming a greater than teenagers online with extremists exploiting this uh, very emotional uh, vulnerability. Uh, it, essentially, extremists often seek to promote and sense uh, the, the sense of belonging and community uh, within their organizations, uh, appealing for young people who are currently missing uh, their regular social connections and are often feeling very isolated. Uh, and in particular, gaming platforms have become increasingly popular. Uh, uh, extremists are, are taking advantage of, of the concept of a shared hobby or a shared interest to form connections to aid in, in potential uh, uh, recruitment. Uh, to your second question of, of what we think uh, is positive, I, I just say, first off, that, that uh, government can't do very much in this space. Uh, but where we can, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, to... Uh, promote how technology can be applied in multiple sectors to, to build resiliency. Uh, it can be overwhelming for all of us to hear how dangerous the internet has become, but it's important to remember that it can also be used to, to forge connections and, and, um, uh, and to address those major factors of social isolation. Uh, we do this in a number of ways. Uh, we uh, conduct awareness briefings uh, for public audiences and also for select uh, law enforcement audiences, uh, essentially a, a uh, uh, terrorism 101, explaining how uh, terrorists are using various platforms uh, and also approaching people uh, offline and uh, their, their tactics for inspiration, recruitment, and mobilization. Uh, we offer this uh, virtually now in the COVID environment. We also host digital forums to showcase how technology can be used uh, these events uh, essentially help to build the capacity of credible voices in the online space. Uh, part of the problem is to try to uh, encourage people who do have some natural credibility, whether they're community leaders, faith leaders, uh, the head of a, a, a parent-teacher association, for instance, uh, who have a natural capability but aren't necessarily 
uh, equipped with uh, marketing skills and the ability to uh, to project their message online. Uh, so we host digital forums, uh, bringing in uh, uh, knowledgeable experts from the tech sector and the marketing sector to teach people how to be more effective. Uh, but I would also say that we're very encouraged by the positive ways that technology and the gaming industries are responding to terrorism and targeted violence in the digital space. Um, everything from chat filters, uh, you may have heard about the, the grade of, of uh, Sony PlayStations, for instance, uh, terms of service, uh, making it a much more open environment so that anyone can see uh, any chat and be able to uh, report uh, what they're what they're seeing and and uh, play a role in countering uh, online um, uh, negativity, so to speak. Uh, but one of the ways that companies can play a role is is by certainly enacting and enforcing the policies in terms of services that they've created. Certainly, like to see more staff time uh, dedicated uh, throughout the industry uh, to enforcing the the terms of services that uh, that. Uh, companies have Thank you. Uh, taken um, the initiative to to adopt. David and and Neil, I want to turn to you because we we've talked we talked just now about uh, child sexual exploitation and terrorism as kind of two separate issues. But in your world, when you look at cybercrime online, I think um, you've shared that oftentimes you see them intermingled and you see different crime types in one case. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how these things sometimes converge in the online world um, and how we tackle that? Thanks, Julie. I think the, the premise that we see most striking now is, and this is really since COVID especially, is a reduction in capability by law enforcers, prosecutors and judges around the world. Most of the work that my staff and I do is building the capability of cops and prosecutors to do their work. And since COVID has kicked off, we have seen a loss of capability through specialists who have gotten ill, specialists who have been redeployed to do, I don't know, quarantine enforcement work, various other things like that. And it creates that perfect storm of criminality and, and both sort of Ian, Yota, Steve, everyone has said how, how the, the criminality has grown during this time. So I think what we're seeing, we've just completed a dark net analysis in Southeast Asia and the clear risk coming out of what we've done is to see that there is no policy in place. Most governments have not prioritized these issues. And that's the same as clear net child sexual exploitation. It, it plays very much to what everyone has already said, that this is not getting always in front of the right people who make decisions. And it seems to me that when we hear some of the discussions about, for example, photo DNA or any of the technical solutions, I think we can pretty much guarantee that those making these decisions have never had to deal with this sort of casework. They have never seen a child being raped on camera. They have never dealt with a victim or tens or hundreds or thousands of victims. That doesn't mean that there isn't a debate to be had, I'm not saying that. But I do think that sometimes that these decisions are being taken in the dark. And that's why the work that we do is so important. I mean, we collectively, all of us on this call, all of you who are joining today to try, try and shine a light onto this, because if you look at many of you in the US, the capability that you have through HSI, FBI, DOJ and others to counter this is enormous. Many of the countries that my staff work with have three or four investigators. So how do you use three or four people to counter the sorts of numbers that Yota is talking about? And that's just from a NICMEC reporting line. We may have other methods of reporting in the countries that we're dealing with. So clearly prosecution and investigation can never be the answer, which is why we come back to the prevention which is where tech is so important. And when I read, you know, I was reading the draft mm -hmm. European Council uh, decision re recently and listening to some of these debates, and it, it strikes me that we really need to be pushing, I think, much harder on simply educating those policymakers and politicians making these decisions because they don't oftentimes get it. They don't get the threat involved. They don't get the impact involved. And that's what we do around the world when we sit with a policymaker, with a minister, with a head of state and explain this stuff. It's the same reaction that we're all giving now of, oh, my God, that's horrendous. I can't believe the scale. What do we do about it? But how do we turn that into action when we see the clear capability that we have now being threatened? When we see the growth in this, and I, I saw a, a report from, I think it was the Internet Watch Foundation in the UK today saying that 44 percent 
of their reporting this year was from self-generated imagery. So it's getting back into the space of helping our kids to minimize their own risks online. And my staff in the past couple of weeks, they uh, in Honduras and Central America, over a five week period, and if ever there's a, an advantage of what we've done with COVID is changing our business operating model. In five weeks, we had five and a half thousand teachers online with us once a week to understand what online child sexual exploitation looks like. What is cybersecurity for kids, for parents, for caregivers? And as a direct result of that, we have had children come forward as victims and self-report the crimes that they have been subject to. But because we have already built the law enforcement capability and got the legislation in place and got the policy narrative in the right place, we can do something about that. But it really, really worries me. And this is my view, not the UN view. My view is that the way we are going here, some of the decisions that might be made are fundamentally going to undermine some of the most basic of human rights which is our right to life. I've certainly dealt with casework where kids have killed themselves as a result of what's happened to them online. And Steve, I'm sure you're the same. We've all heard about this. We've all seen this at scale. And we just need to change the narrative. And it comes back to that balance. Human rights, privacy, freedoms of speech. There comes a limit to that as well that we have to engage with. And I think, Steve, you, you, you made it perfectly clear there. If people did this outside in the street, they'd be appalled. But by saying it's okay to do it online because there's a privacy element to it, we have got the balance wrong if we're in that space. And I'll finish up with saying, I remember, uh, Steve, the last time you and I were together was at the, uh, at the Vatican a couple of years ago. And I remember someone in the audience uh, at the thing that we were at discussing how uh, child abuse online was the price that had to be paid for privacy and freedom of speech. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding and that there are balances to be struck. And... It also strikes me that one, there isn't necessarily one size fits all to this response. And it comes back to the political democracy that you live in. Because if you live in a country where there is parliamentary judicial oversight of law enforcement, of intelligence agencies, of capability, then there is a way of having discussions of balancing risks to privacy and fundamental freedom. The challenge is if we get language that might work well in the US or might work well in the UK or might work well elsewhere, if you apply that language in states where there are no fundamental freedoms, where the government may seek to use that to crush political democracy and freedoms of speech, we get into some really difficult spaces. And I think we just have to consider what those responses ought to look like, what the role of tech companies ought to be, how we deal with cryptocurrency enablers and exchanges and some other methods of targeting the, the financial aspects of this. I'll stop there. I'm sure someone's going to end on a happy note, but uh, I'll hand it back to you there, Julie. Um, Ian, did you want to chime uh, in? I, I, I'm sure I could claim that on a on a on a happy note, but I mean, I, I mean, I, I think there is, um, you know, in the same way as no one entity is going to is going to grip um, these kind of, sort of very very complex harms. No one intervention is going to is going to work. So it's not just going to be you know, we can't arrest our way out of the situation. Um, that, you know, that's just not tenable. But on the other hand, tech isn't going to be a silver bullet to to deal with it. And also there needs to be, um, you know, there's great work happening uh, UK with the Stop It Now, Lucy Faithful program sort of intervening to try and stop. And I think the goal has to be to try and stop the problem before it happens. But on the other hand, there are always going to be offenders out there. Um, I think we're, we're dealing with aspects of human nature, same way as there are always going to be murderers and thieves and all, all other kinds of criminals. So there needs to be a, a, a holistic um, response that attacks the problem from, from uh, all the different angles um, that, we can, that we can think of and then try and move, away, uh, move forward. But I think there has to be a debate where we wrestle with some of the big questions that Neil um, has, has highlighted. Um, this isn't a simple thing, um, but we need to all come into it and engage it because this, these are these innovations that are coming through. Um, we need to think about the the implications more widely. So let me. Uh, I have a few questions from the audience, and and I think um, Neil, your conversation leads to one of them. Um, and Ian, you you laid out there won't be a silver bullet. We have to have prevention, detection, and prosecution. Um, and but the question was. 
why, and I'll be curious if anyone has an answer to this, why has there been so little funding for prevention efforts? Um, and then maybe I'll build on this question of how can we get more focus on prevention as a, an important leg on the stool to combat this? So the, the why isn't there, and then I'm gonna add in is any ideas of how. So Neil and David, if you wanna chime in. Thanks, Julia. Sure, I'll, I'll chime in from the government perspective. I mean, I, I think that that uh, it, it is very true that dollar for dollar, much less is spent on prevention. Uh, historically, uh, it's starting to correct itself. Our office, for instance, is is uh, about uh, four times uh, uh, larger than it was just a year ago, and uh, we're headed. Uh, if if new budgets uh, that are proposed uh, pass, we'll be increasing, and we'll also be increasing the amount of uh, funding that we're uh, delivering to non-government organizations through our grant programs for prevention. Uh, so it is a little bit, uh, there, there's a, 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 a slight correction uh, um, uh, starting to happen. Uh, however, in terms of the actual question of why uh, there is this imbalance, it's really uh, threefold. Uh, first off, uh, historically, prevention hasn't really been proven to be successful. Uh, it's very hard to essentially establish a baseline of uh, pulling somebody, for instance, out of the pathway of uh, violent extremism, if we're talking about terrorism and targeted violence, uh, which is which is our specialty. It's hard to prove that you have uh, have uh, taken someone out of that, that pathway without establishing where they were to begin with. Uh, and creating that kind of baseline is very difficult. Uh, that said, uh, again, in recent years, we have started to establish uh, some proof that prevention programming does work. Uh, so that's one. And the second reason I think why, uh, why it hasn't really uh, uh, taken hold as a priority in funding is simply that it's not necessarily a government mission, uh, exclusively government mission. Uh, unlike detection and certainly investigation and prosecution, uh, you don't find that everyone is in agreement that government should be uh, managing uh, the 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 of prevention programming. Uh, certainly government can be uh, the promoter of prevention activities, and that's what our office is trying to do by creating local prevention frameworks that, uh, that uh, bring together mental health professionals, uh, the tech sector, parenting groups, et cetera, uh, along with local law enforcement. Uh, but we don't intend to manage those activities because a lot of them are occurring in a space that's, uh, and this gets to the third point, a space that's really protected by uh, uh, First Amendment uh, protections here, at least, and I'm, I'm sure uh, civil liberties concepts uh, elsewhere around the world as well, kind of limit the government role in acting before someone has actually done something that amounts to uh, a, uh, a, a, a predicate for law enforcement action. Uh, and that really gets me to, uh, to a point I, I meant to share earlier, which is that uh, you know, studies have shown that 75% of planned attacks, uh, community members, including peers, family, uh, religious leaders, have observed the warning sign, the signs and indicators long before the attack actually occurred. And so if we can start to begin to encourage a whole society approach where people feel responsible for uh, being a part of an intervention framework, uh, we will see that uh, there will be much more action in the prevention space than ever before. The problem of, of prevention and not just rely on government funding. Uh, they need to understand the concept of, of risk factors and indicators. I dropped uh, a, a product that we've produced into the chat for people to take a look at what we mean by indicators and risk factors. Uh, and you'll see we're not proposing that government uh, be the arbiter of, of what an indicator or a risk factor is, because again, it's really going to be uh, a parent or a friend who notices that someone has changed from their version of normal. Not to say that there is a profile of what is normal and what isn't normal, but somebody has changed over time in comparison to where they were. And it's going to be a parent or a cousin or a friend who notices that change. Okay. And, and then, Neil, we have about two really minutes left in our panel. In, so, Neil, I know you uh, want to chime in on this answer as well. Uh, interactions. Thanks, I'll be really quick. Um, the biggest secret in development is that no one knows if it works. 
because measuring something that didn't happen is so difficult. And for my bit of the organization, we are entirely donor funded. So when I'm asked by a donor, what are you going to be able to do on X, Y, Z? I can't go in and say, by doing this, I will prevent those things from happening. Because as much as when you spin the narrative, people say, that's great, we know it's gonna happen and we know from experience that it works. Someone sitting with an Excel sheet in a budget department who's giving you taxpayers money will say, well, you can't guarantee that that's gonna happen. And it sometimes comes down to the basics like that of it's easier to train more cops because you can put a number around it rather than saying, we spoke to 5,000 teachers and look at that, nine kids came out and said what had happened to them because we couldn't have predicted that and we can't predict that. And my message to government is we've got to be comfortable not being able to put a number on everything. Not everything has to be quantified. There is a qualitative measure of impact that we can discuss. And we need to be comfortable with that because I think that's what the public expect of us. Thank you. So we are we have hit our time frame. Um, I want to thank our panelists. You all are on the front lines of doing very difficult work. Um, as I mentioned before, it's work that's often unseen because people don't want to look at the dark side of um, our humanity sometimes. And we see it every day online. And thanks to everyone who joined the panel to learn more about this. Um, it sounds like there were a few great links shared throughout um, and you can tap into the organizations of David, Neil, Ian, Steve, and Yoda um, for resources. And thank you, Fosi, for hosting this panel and this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.